Well, we are going to be continuing in our study of Matthew, and today we're going to be looking at Matthew 13 is really a bunch of parables, and we're going to look at two really short parables today, uh, teaching the same idea, but it's a really, really deep idea. So this morning we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 13, verses 44 through 46, and, uh, and I'd invite you to open up your Bibles to keep it open throughout our time. But let me begin by reading these. Again, they're just two really short parables that you have a a ton that is packed in to these few verses. Matthew 13, starting in verse 44. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. And then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and brought it. May God bless the reading of his word. Let me pray. Father, I thank you for the privilege again that we have to come together this morning. Father, to be able to dive into your word. Thank you for the truths that are here. Father, for the way that you continue to to teach me. And I pray now that your spirit would speak through me and in spite of me. Father, help us not to hear the opinions of a man, but Father, that somehow through a man that you would speak the timeless truth of your word. Father, help us each one to be sensitive to and responsive to what your spirit may have to say to us this morning. Father, through these words of of your son, Jesus, we pray your blessing now in Jesus' name, amen. You know, it's usually not hard to tell what someone is really passionate about. It can often be kind of obvious. I think a huge example of that is that is that some people are, are football fans and some people are, are really passionate to a whole different degree about their team. Uh, if, you, if you have a chance to go to a big time college game or a pro game, you could tell that there's a difference. Now, now I would say I've been a lifelong fan of the Ohio State Buckeyes and the Cleveland Browns. And, and, um, but again, if you ever go to a game especially, you realize there are people that take the whole idea of fandom to another level. So for example, go down to Ohio State and, uh, and you go tailgating, you get there early and there are people that are not just tailgating, they've got these huge buses, you know, these, these you know, RVs that are customized to the extreme and, and you're kind of wondering, you know, how much money have you spent on, on, on their love for Ohio State? You know, this isn't just about the tickets, this is everything. Or, or you have some people that, if I go up, you know, I have an Ohio State shirt and some people splurge for the jersey and, and then there are others who take the dressing up to a whole new level you know, where it's like an all-day thing. And, and generally, you would look at somebody like this and you'd say, that's kind of crazy, that's extreme. And yet, when you're passionate about your team, you want everyone to know how crazy and extreme you are. That's a good thing. Or it isn't just limited to, again, Ohio State or college. Let's take pros. Again, even though the Cleveland Browns have been terrible since returning to the league in 1999, they still have passionate fans who go and buy season tickets and are there all the time. And, and they schedule the whole, you know, week around the game. And then, and then especially when, when they're Sunday, they go there and they brag about all that they do and how much money they can spend. And I mean, I'm just thinking, okay, this guy spent all that money on the bus. I'm pretty sure he doesn't drive that to work. You know, I'm sure, you know, that's not like something you're using all the day. It's only something you're using, you know, eight or nine times a year but you're proud of what you spent. Why is that? When we see that kind of passion in a fan, it illustrates a really basic principle in life. And that is that we will all always naturally and freely give what is most or what is important to us in the pursuit of what is of supreme value. We're gonna naturally do it. So you look at it and so somebody, time and money and and all that, and you have people that will naturally and be proud and, and in a sense brag about the sense of saying, well, here's what I'm giving up to pursue what is of supreme passion to me. And so whether you're really passionate about something like your team or, or uh, you know, whatever it would be, you're, you're willing to not only spend, but to kind of, you know, to be a fool and brag about what a fool you are for what you're willing to support. And again, it's not just in sports. I think another example that every once in a while you see a concert or you see a new product coming out and there are people that will literally spend sleep out overnight for the chance to spend hundreds of dollars to buy a concert ticket. And then again, they're going to brag about all the sacrifice that they made to be able to attend that concert. People will give all kinds of time and effort to their hobbies and all this money. And again, they're bragging about, boy, I've saved this money. Look at how much I spent for this hobby. And uh, because when something is important to us, we are willing to spend that which is important to pursue that which is of supreme value or even in relationships. 
Again, you see how often you see somebody, you know, they've got new love and we're so in love and, and suddenly all their time is together. And again, they're saving money to go out and, you know, do this special activity and, you know, spend all this money on a wedding because it's worth it. It's worth the pursuit of that joy. And the idea is that, you know, what we think of as a supreme joy, we'll naturally pursue. And uh, we're pursuing the thing that we think that will meet our deepest need. Now, again, when we say this, I think it's true of all areas of life. It's true for sports, for hobbies, for relationships. But I think it's also true in our relationship with God. See, we will always naturally and freely give what is important to us in the pursuit of what is of supreme value. If you can always look at a person and say, you know, you can tell what they're passionate is about based on what they want to give to, what they want to spend time on, well, let, let us ask in our own lives. You know, if I were to say that all of us have something that we're so passionate about, where is God in that value chart in us? What does our pursuit of time and effort and even finances and all those things say about how important God is? Now, what we're gonna see is that these questions really come from the principles that are being taught here in these, these two little parables that Jesus is giving us. And, and as we dive into these parables, let me take a minute and kind of give an overview, and, and not only an overview, but looking at some of the cultural and historical context that might help, you know, I think the idea is kind of clear, but when we see the context, it might even make it a little more clear. You know, first we have the parable of the hidden treasure in verse 44. And we're told that the kingdom of heaven, okay, this is all ref, you know, referring to the kingdom of heaven, a relationship with God. It's like a, hidden tre- a treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up. And then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. Now, we're not told why this guy's in the field, what he's doing, but somehow he comes across this, this, you know, this treasure, this buried treasure, and, and he's excited about it. And, you know, and, and you know, even as I think about that, how many of us have ever kind of dreamed of that happening? You know, that we just, you know, we think about, you know, we come find this hidden treasure and we hear stories of hidden treasures and actually it's even big business. I looked it up, you know, they say on average Americans spend $160 million on metal detectors every year. And uh, so we're spending, you know, hundreds of million dollars looking for things to help us find hidden treasure. And I think we probably spend more than we find, but the problem is that we watch movies like National Treasure and we're thinking, well, it might just happen. You know, it just might be me. And, and so people pursue this. Now, here's what we think. In our mind, in our context, finding a hidden treasure is pretty much fictional. And so we read a story like that. We think, you know, well, that's kind of a fictional story. It's not realistic. But here's what we need to realize. In Jesus' day, it actually was, wasn't uncommon. And here's why. Back in Jesus' day, there were no banks. There were no places that you would go to Put to keep your money to keep it safe. And so, so you would protect your money by hiding it. And specifically, if there was a threat of some kind of invasion, a military invasion, which was often the case in the Middle East, uh, what would happen is you'd realize, okay, this, this enemy's coming. If they conquer us, they're going to go through our house. They're going to take everything that we own as plunder. So what people do is that they would take their wealth and they would bury it in a place that the armies wouldn't find it. Now, what would happen is that oftentimes they would, would have a, a, you know, a, a, an arm of the fight that would come and maybe the person would be killed or maybe they would be taken captive and, and suddenly this person that buried the, te- the treasure isn't there to unbury it. Nobody knows where it's at. And so it was not at all uncommon for people to find buried treasure. It, when he tells this story, it's something that everybody actually related to. So he says, in this parable, this guy finds his treasure, he covers it back up, and he goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. Now, even in that, that raises a, a question that people will often ask. Is, wasn't that unethical, you know, that he found that he covered it up, and, and then he, you know, he, he didn't tell the person about it? And, and here's what we need to remember. This is a parable that is making a single point. It's about t- teaching us how to view the kingdom of God, how to value the kingdom of God. It's not teaching us about business ethics. It's not saying this guy, you know, did this in real life and it was good. And so, so we can't take it too far. He's not telling us this is what we should do as far as if we find treasure. His mo- main point is that he found this treasure and he immediately goes and sells everything. And here's where I want you to see, I think, the three most important words in, in this, the whole parable. And that is what does he, look what he says. He finds it and then we're told, you know, it's like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. And then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. In his joy, 
and everything, he sells everything. Now, usually, if you think about it, if you tell a guy, well, you have to walk away from everything you own, you're going to sell everything that you own, that would be devastating. But yet, in this case, in his joy, he's selling everything because there's a sense that he's looking at that and realizing that all the treasure that I'm divesting myself of, well, that hurts, but I'm gaining something that is far superior to that which I'm selling. Again, the second parable makes pretty much the same idea, a few small changes. He tells us again in verse 45, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant selling fine pearls, who upon finding a pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. Now again, here's the context. In Jesus' day, a pearl was the greatest of, you know, most valuable jewel in the ancient world. They were more, far more valuable than diamonds or rubies or anything else. And then a lot of that is that they were just really hard to get. So nowadays we think we have divers and we, have, you know, we can dive down there and harvest them. And so they're expensive, but they're not that valuable. And that day, they didn't have all that. So a, a big pearl was of tremendous value. Now to give you an example, we know that Queen Cleopatra had a single pearl that was valued at 25 million denarii. Now a denarii was a day's wage. So it's now estimated in today's dollars that would be worth between three and four billion dollars, a single pearl. And so you look at that and you say, okay, you know, that's what, that's, you know, these are extreme value. And so what he's saying is people, again, would understand that. And so Jesus is saying, you know, that, okay, here's this guy, this, this, this uh, merchant, and he's looking, and suddenly he understands what good pearls are. And there's someone who's selling it, and he doesn't realize what a treasure this is. But he looks at it and says, man, this is like the Cleopatra pearl. This is of extreme value. Now, in both parables, there's a similar point. Both men encounter something of such priceless value that it makes everything else in their life look worthless. In a sense, both are illuminated by a truth. Both see something that other people don't see. You know, they, you know the other people are walking through the, you know, that path. They, didn't, they don't know what's there. And because both of them see that, they take extreme action to pursue that thing of ultimate value. Enjoy. What does it say? Enjoy. They went and they sold everything. Now, there are a few important points here. One is that when you look at it, both parables are teaching that there's a sense that the treasure of the gospel is something that is, in a sense, hidden. It's, it's hidden in a sense that, not that God is keeping it from us, but it's something that, that people miss. That, you know, there are people that would walk over that, that uh, field every day and have no idea that they're walking over a great value. There, there's other, that, you know, that, that pearl was there being sold and other people didn't see it. They couldn't see the incredible value. They totally missed it. You know, you know, they, or they might, like the pearl, they might see that it has some value but not extreme. And, and, you know, but the other things that I have are of greater value, so I'm not willing to sell that which I have because, and Jesus is saying, no, in reality, what we're doing is we're pursuing the trinkets all the while we're missing the ultimate treasure that's right in front of us. Now, this is an idea that it's actually taught throughout the Bible. So, for example, in, in Colossians chapter 2, Paul prays, he prays this, that their, their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of the f- full assurance of the understanding of the knowledge of God's mystery, which in Christ in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So it's something that's a mystery. It's something that's hidden. And what is that? This treasure. He's saying that the greatest treasure in life, the greatest riches in life, the real riches that ultimately will meet our deepest need, the thing that is most valuable is this relationship with Jesus. It's the thing that will satisfy our deepest longing, that will bring us the the most transcendent joy. And it's there that we will find that. Now, I think about all the people that over the years have spent all the time not only searching after all these treasures that might or may not be there and that might do that or more practically, all the things in life that we pursue as our ultimate treasure. And, and we realize, okay, what a, what a terrible thing if we spend our life pursuing treasures that won't satisfy, all the while missing something that's right here. It's this relationship with Christ, this guaranteed treasure that will meet this deepest need. And if I understand that, then I will be foolish to do anything but to give my whole energy towards seeking after that. Now, that's the point that Jesus is making in these parables. This, again, this treasure is hidden in the sense that it's there, but the people don't see it. And Jesus is is literally digging it out for us. And he's saying, okay, I want to show you. Here's the treasure. I want you to see this. Now, why is it our true treasure? Because the basic spiritual principle is that we were not only created by God, 
We were created for God. We were created for relationship with God. We were created in a sense with a hole in our heart that, that is filled ultimately the, at the center of our heart with relationship with God. But because of sin, that relationship was broken. And so what we do is we have this incredible need of something that is gonna bring us significance and stability and, and joy and, 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 and transcendent purpose. And, and we go after one thing after another trying to pursue anything that will fill that spot in our hole. And we're saying there may be good things, but ultimately, We will try to do it by relationships and wealth and pleasure and and amusements and hobbies and career and children. Many of these things in themselves aren't necessarily bad. They may be good things, but they're not God things. When, When God's at the center of life, they bring us joy, but when we try to make them the center of our life, they will ultimately fail because they aren't designed to meet that deepest need. Again, look at how God describes this in the book of Jeremiah. He says this, For my people have committed two evils, for they have forsaken me, the fountain of the living waters, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. So we do first two things. Number one is we're created to have God at the center, and so we forsake God. We basically say, okay, God, we're not gonna make you at the center, we're not gonna make that, but then we try to to make cisterns for ourselves. We try to dig out wells that we will say, okay, this is the thing that's going to meet my need, that's gonna satisfy me. But, But what does he say? They're broken cisterns that can hold no water. And I think the idea here is that, is that they all leak. You know, they all, there are many things in our world that can provide pleasure in a moment, security in a moment, joy in a moment, and, and we will pursue these things, but what happens is they all leak. They don't ultimately satisfy. And so what happens is that we go, we become you know, passionate about trying this and trying this and trying harder because, because this was a moment, but I need more of it. It never satisfies my deepest need. Or, or what often happens too is that well, I need this, but now I become you know, uh, driven by fear that I might lose that because, because I need it to be happy. And Jesus is saying, no, we need to realize that the ultimate treasure, the, the, the thing that will fill that deepest vacuum of our heart is a relationship with our God. That's this truth that is there, that is, but it's hidden because people can't see it. So when we look at that, we come back and we say, if we under, do understand it, what will we do? What drove the man to sell everything that he had in the field? To go back to verse 44, in his joy he goes and sells all that he has. And what Jesus is teaching us here is that when we understand all of these principles, the reason that we will pursue a relationship with God is that we're driven by the enticement of joy. We're driven by an enticement of a sense of a greater joy. The gospel is the source of greatest joy. That's what the parable is saying. In both of them, you know, you have people that find something in their joy, they willingly liquidate everything. They willingly sell everything they have because they're excited about what they gain. Now again, if you think of any other context, if you tell somebody you've got to take everything you have and you have to sell it, you have to divest yourself of everything and, and, and a lot of those things are of importance and valuable and we would be devastated. But again, this man is, is, is filled with joy because he realizes what he's gaining is far more significant than what he's losing. Now again, here's what we have to ask. Is that, is that true? Of, does that describe your, you know, you're discovering the kingdom of God? I think for a lot of people, that's not what they think of. I think for a lot of people, if you talk about what does it mean to follow Christ, they see it in terms of what you give up, of what you lose, and, and, and people often see it as rules, and, and you know, that people will say, and discovering the kingdom, it's like giving up freedom and freedom not to do this and not to do, not to do the things that I think they will be happy and, but I need to do it because I don't want to go to hell. And, and, and people think of that and it shows that we often, um, um, how much we misunderstand who Jesus is and what he's offering to us. See, it, it confronts this deeply ingrained myth in our culture that, that God's there and, and he's upset with us because we want to be happy. He's upset with us because we're, you know, we're looking for, for joy in life and he just wants us to be miserable and one day we get happiness in heaven. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that we pursue a relationship with God out of joy, the pursuit of joy in life. And there is a denying of ourselves of things, yes, but we deny ourselves of secondary things because it focuses us on the primary. God wants us to pursue him out of joy, not out of duty. Okay, let's think about this. We understand this to be true in our human relationships. Okay, let's, let's think about it in context of marriage. 
Okay, I can think back on my wedding day and my wedding day and my bride and, and, and me were standing at the altar and we're standing in front of the pastor. And, and what if the pastor would have looked at Sandy and said, you know, Sandy, you know, do you have some vows that you have written for Michael? And, uh, and she said, yes. And she pulls them out and she reads the following vows. Today, I commit myself to a lifelong marriage relationship with Michael. And in that relationship, I hereby renounce all my desires for happiness, for romance, for physical intimacy, and for joy in life to become the committed wife of Michael. I'd be sitting there, whoa, wait, wait a second. You know, that's not what I want you to promise. That's not what I want you to think. I don't want you to forsake those things for me. You're not forsaking happiness and intimacy and joy. No, I want you to find those things in me. Oh, you're saying you're forsaking all these other things because I want to commit myself. It's not about miserable duty and marriage. It's about saying commit ourselves so that we find that meaning in each other, in relationship with each other. And that's the same idea in our relationship with God. It, God isn't glorified when we serve him out of duty. That's not how we should think about it. It's not that God doesn't want you to be happy. God's not, on, God's not upset because we're seeking happiness. God's upset for us because we try to find happiness in the wrong things, in things outside of, our, of himself, things that he knows will fail. Let's go back to Jeremiah. Again, what does Jeremiah say? God's upset, first of all, because we've turned away from God. We've turned away from the true source, the true evil, so we've forsaken him and we hew out cisterns for ourselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water, that we're looking at the wrong things. And again, so to, to kind of put this simple, the, the, you know, the problem, our sin isn't that we're seeking joy in life. God actually wants us to be driven by the pursuit of joy. That's, that's the point in this parable that it's teaching. It's my sin isn't that we're seeking joy, but it's that we're seeking joy in the wrong things. That we're seeking contentment, fulfillment in things other than God. God isn't upset at you because you want to be happy. He's upset at you because you've turned away from the living God, the only one who can truly satisfy your deepest needs. And instead of things, we're, we're trying to find that joy and contentment, meaning and worthless idols that will never, they're, they're broken cisterns. They'll never satisfy. And again, you could almost say God's not upset at you in a sense because, he, you, know, because you want to be happy. He's upset for you because you want, you're seeking in happiness and things outside of himself. Okay, let's go back to the illustration of marriage. And um, okay, let's say if we're thinking about marriage and, and, and I said, okay, I wanna, I wanna love my wife. I wanna glorify her. I wanna, I wanna in a sense, to, to love her well. What's that look like? Now, what if on the day that I get married, you find out that you know, I'm talking to a friend of mine and, you, you know, and I say, well, you know, I'm getting ready to get married. I know there's a lot of girls that are a lot, not, not, I think way more beautiful than Sandy. There's a lot that I think would be happier with a lot of those other girls than I would be with her. But I feel like God's called me to love Sandy and that means to, to commit myself to her and, and it's the right thing to do. And uh, so I wanna be the godly man and make a commitment in spite of how I feel. Now, what would you be thinking? Would you be thinking, wow, what a man of character. Wow, that's a guy that really loves his wife. No, you would be thinking, what's wrong with the guy? You don't know what love is. See, that's not loving her. That's not glorifying her. When I love her the most, what, I'm, what I would say is that I would say, when I met you, I lost interest in other girls. You know, when I met you, what I'm, you know, and you use the wording of the parable here, I found this pearl a great price. And I was willing to sell everything else, all my other dating life, all the other opportunities that I have because I found this one supreme relationship and out of joy, I sold everything else to be able to invest in the supreme treasure. And that's the way it was. Again, on my wedding day, I'm not looking out there and saying, boy, there's hundreds of people. There's some pretty girls out here. I wonder if I have a chance with that one. You know, no, I'm not thinking that. If I'm thinking that, you think there's a problem there. I'm not thinking about the women I'm leaving behind. I'm focused on, on the woman that I'm pursuing. I'm focused on the treasure that God has given me. And I, with joy, with supreme joy, I give up everything to pursue that one treasure. I was consumed with the joy of what I was gaining, not concerned about what I was losing. See, that's how God wants us to feel about him. That's what this is teaching. You know, another passage, it says something kind of unique. I, you know, I've never really even thought about this before, but in Nehemiah, Nehemiah says this, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. And I've heard that before. I never really thought about it. And you think, how is the joy of our, of our, you know, in our Lord, the, the strength in our Christian life. It's not, not willpower, it's joy. How is that? 
Where does the strength to obey Jesus come from? Where does it come to, to endure in difficult times? You know where it comes from? Not, there are, in the short run, it might be at times willpower, I've gotta do what's right, but in the long run, our motivation comes from the pursuit of joy. The conviction that if I follow God, that in the long run, that following and being faithful to him will bring greater joy than turning away from him. That it will bring greater joy than the disappointment, than the temptation that I'm facing. In the long run, your willpower will never be enough. It's only if we understand the joy, that, that we have to be consumed with this greater joy. Now, I know we can hear this, these parables and we can think, well, okay, they're kind of obvious in a sense. You know, if I found this buried treasure, uh, you know, wouldn't it be a no-brainer for anybody to kind of sell everything they have to buy this, this field that's had this credible treasure? Now here you've got to realize, again, Jesus' point in this parable to all of us is that this treasure is real. And so he's speaking as one saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in his field. Now what has he been talking about in Matthew 13? The kingdom of heaven, everything he's been saying, my message, my relationship with me, here's the treasure, I'm putting it in front of you. The challenge is, do you believe it? See, and here's what we need to realize is that to really understand this, we've got to realize there's an importance of faith in that pursuit of joy. You see, to have this joy, we have to believe Jesus. We have to believe that the treasure is what he says it is. But the problem is in our culture, our culture will say, well, fallen Christ, well, that's not treasure, that's a burden. And no, the real treasure in the pursuit of the pleasures of the world. So the question is, who do we believe? See, if we believe the world, then we think it would be foolish to sell everything that we have to commit ourselves to Christ. It would be foolish to give up our, our self-control, our freedom and, and our ability to decide our own way. It would be foolish to do that because, because this is the way of joy. This is the treasure. But on the other hand, if we really believe God, then it will be obvious. If we really understand this, then it will be obvious and with great joy, we will give up everything to pursue the ultimate treasure. Now, part of this is understanding there's a difference between the biblical idea of joy and happiness. See, both parables tell us of these men that sold everything that he had to buy the old thing of ultimate value. Now, again, think about that. If you think about practically, what would it be like to sell everything you own? And there's a lot of things that are, that are valuable to you. For this person, there would be a lot of things that would be heirlooms that would be passed down from family to family, things that were of extreme importance. And, and in the short run, there's pain. So if you have somebody that says, well, I'm gonna liquidate everything, that takes a matter of a month or it takes time and, and you're selling everything you're giving and there's short-term pain. Are you happy about having to sell these things that are important to you? Is there happiness in that? No. There's short-term pain, but yet there's, he's driven past the pain of selling because he's motivated by a deeper joy of long-term, if I do this, I get this great treasure. See, happiness is focused on immediate gratification. It doesn't make me happy to sell everything that I own. See, the long-term joy of owning the treasure drives me through the short-term pain. I think about this even as a, as a new grandfather. I've, I've been thinking about this just from the experience of seeing you know, my daughter with a little baby, and I'm reminded, as a, you know, some of, we have some new, new parents here. And you understand, if you think about it, you know, as a new parent, there is some short-term pain. There is some cost. You think about it, parents, you know, you don't get much sleep. You've got a baby that's crying all the time. You don't know what it is. It's frustrating. You know, you're trying to figure out what's going on, how to care for the baby. There's tremendous cost that you're buying all this stuff. Your whole schedule, your whole life is thrown out of whack. And if you look at that and you say, you know, are you happy about that? As a parent, is a new parent happy about, man, I'm so happy, I'm not sleeping at all. No, of course not. You know, man, this is wonderful. My kids are crying and I have no idea what's going on. Boy, what a joy that it is. No, that's not at all the case. There's all kinds of things as a new parent kind of embraces that are kind of in the short run difficult. There's a cost. But yet I see my, my daughter and there's a joy that transcends. There's a joy that you look at it and say, in spite of all these things, man, we're so excited about this little baby. Why? Because they see the long-term benefit and joy of this new life that makes, it, that makes the short-term cost seem minimal. You don't even think of it as a cost. Let me try to illustrate it another way. Hey, let's say you're called out of your job one day and, and your boss comes and he says, okay, I've got this special assignment for you. 
I'm going to put you in this room, and there are 5,000 envelopes, and I want you to lick these 5,000 envelopes to send in the mail. And I see some of you, it's like, uh, you know, just like, just drudgery. I mean, that would be, you, know, you think about, oh, man, I hate the idea. If you knew you were going into the office, and that was the job for the day, you know, and they didn't have one of the things that you could, you know, you, you know use, you just had to lick them. And I mean, that'd be drudgery. It'd be terrible, right? Now, what if your boss came and said, okay, not only that, but I want to let you know that for each envelope that you lick, you get a $1,000 bonus. <laughs> now, does that change your day a little bit? Yeah. You know, suddenly you went from drudgery to saying, oh, man, this is terrible. Why am I doing this? My tongue's dried out. To, man, I can't, you know, I, I, I want to stay here. Can I do more? We're suddenly motivated by the reward. But now I think about how faith is so important in that process. So let's stay with that illustration. Okay, you've been promised a bonus of $1,000 per envelope at your next pay period, you know, at the end of the month. And, and so will you be motivated by joy? Yes, as long as you believe your boss. But what if you don't believe your boss? What if you think he's just making it up? You have two employees working side by side. Both of them heard the same promise. One believes the boss. Man, they're out there. They can't look them fast enough. They're excited. The other one doesn't want to get started. They resent. Why did they stick me with this? I don't want to, you know, And because they, they're resenting it, literally. And, and the one, you, somebody will come in and, and a coworker will come in and say, hey, we're, we're, you know, we don't want to do this. We're cutting out early. We're going, you know, we're going to get some drinks. Why don't you come with us? Now, the one who doesn't believe is like, oh, man, I can't wait to get away. I'm going to bail. Because why? The joy of spending time with friends is way better than the drudgery of having to lick envelopes. On the other hand, the person who believes it hears the same coworker, and then there's sense in saying, is there a short-term happiness of going out and spending friend time with friends? Yes. Is that more enjoyable in the moment than licking envelopes? Yes. But it's like, no way in the world am I walking away from this. I'm going to stay here because I'm completely motivated by the long-term reward. But the idea is, is that I've got to believe it. The simple truth is that we will always pursue joy in what we believe to be true. We will always do the things that we think that will give us joy, that will meet us need, meet our needs, that we will pursue what we believe to be the ultimate treasure. So the question is, again, do we believe the short-term promises of the world, the happiness, this is if you do this, you make your own decisions, this is the way, that, this is the way of life? Or do you believe in God? Do you believe in his truth, his promise to long-term joy? Look at what Hebrews talks about, says about this. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Basically, if you want to understand how to do this, you've got to, first of all, come to God and believe that he exists. He knows better than we do. There is a God who is transcendent that knows, you know, that is able to make eternal uh, promises. And out of that, he's good. So if I really believe, again, that I've got a boss that's got the money and he's good for his word, I'm totally motivated. If I don't believe that, I'm not. Faith is believing that there is a God who is in control, who knows everything and is good, and following him will be the source of ultimate joy. When he says this is treasure, it's treasure. Now, why does a person not follow Jesus? Ultimately, it's because they believe that they know better what's good for, them, good for themselves. They believe that their wisdom is better than God's wisdom, that God tells me to do this, but but I, I, want to, I want to call shots for myself because I know better than God. They believe in themselves. They don't believe in God. Why do I fail to obey God in areas of my life? Ultimately, it's because, you know, I believe that God doesn't know what's best. The world's changed. You know, you don't understand, you know, there's, there's values. Those were for time. You know, God know, doesn't know what's best in today's world or, or I don't believe that God is good. He's, he's not really giving me in my best interest. He's holding something good back from me. So because I don't believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him, I don't believe he's good. Well, therefore, I don't follow him. Going back to the parable, I don't believe that Jesus is really speaking the truth when he says this is the ultimate treasure. I think he's lying to me. I think I know what's better. And that's always the case. See, the fact is, is there might be some here that you're, you know that part of your life is out of line with what God calls you to. You're out of line with what God's teaching is. You know you're disobeying him. Why? It's ultimately because you don't believe him. You don't trust him. You think you know better than him. 
You think that your wisdom and, and what you have is a better source of, of joy, is a better source of security. It's a better treasure than what he has for you. So you're not willing to sell everything to get his treasure. No, you're, you're trying to gain up. See, because if you really believed in God, if you really believed that he was good, if you really believed in Jesus, that following him was the ultimate treasure, then the only logical response will be that you want to sell everything to have and pursue this relationship with him. The gospel requires that we sell everything. And, and when you read this, it's logical. Again, both men in these parables literally sell everything else to possess this treasure. That's, and he's saying that's what it means to be a follower of Christ. Now, when we think about it, what does that mean? What well, means to surrender? It means that I come to Christ and I come to be able to say, God, whatever you call me to, wherever you call me to give up, whatever you call me to do, whatever you, I'm willing to do it. Now, do we understand that? If we're a brand new Christian, the good news is God is so gracious to us. He, does, you know, he doesn't point out all our sins all at once. You know, he's so gracious that I've, you know, I've been a believer now for 50 plus years and, and he's still pointing out stuff. And he's so patient, so gracious. I'm so thankful for that. Now, it doesn't mean that, you know, here's everything, you know, no, God, God says, okay, I want you to surrender so that when I point something out, you know, you say, God, if you call me to do this and, and this is what I want to do, I'm going to go with you. And, and there's no, but there's no, sometimes it's like, no, I'm going to sell everything. I give, basically the selling is I give up the right to be my own God, to be my own decider in life, that I'm called, I want to be part of the kingdom, which means that I make you king and I'm willing, to, I'm willing to, to sell everything because I know that this is the ultimate treasure. This is the pearl of great price. And so the question is, are you willing to go wherever God calls you? Are you willing to do whatever God calls you to do? And again, if you're not sure what it's asking, that's okay. But you're saying, whatever you ask, I might struggle at times. I might, it's, I'm, not, I'm not all there, but whatever it is, Jesus, I'm willing to surrender. See, the ultimate question is, what is supreme to you? What is of supreme value? What do you love more than anything else? Because even as we said in the beginning, there's this basic principle that this is teaching, that um, we will naturally and freely give what is of an important to us. These are important things, of freedom and, and you know, self-control and are important, but we will naturally and freely give, joyfully give what is important to us in the pursuit of what is of supreme value. What is supreme? How important is God? What does your life say about that? See, and it's not about choosing a miserable life. It's not about choosing, giving everything good to follow God. It's saying, you know, I give away the things that the world says are good that are good for what is supreme, for the only thing that can satisfy. Now, there may be some here, and it starts with a relationship with Christ. You know, you might think about religion as about, about the doing and about, you know, here's what, you know, I've got to do. And Well, no, it's not about that. It's about literally saying, God, I realize that you created me for a relationship with you that's broken because of sin. I can't fix it myself. Jesus died on the cross to fix it. And I ask you to forgive me through Jesus Christ, my faith in Jesus, to forgive me. And I want to make you the, the key in my life. I want to accept you and, and put you in that key place in my life. I want you to be my treasure. And if you do that today, God starts a process. And, and all of what that means, you won't get it all today. It will start a lifelong process that God will reveal one thing after another after another. But it starts with a decision. And for some here today, that may be, today may be the day that you come and you say, God, you're calling me to that pursuit. God, you've not been this treasure. You've not been the center. And so are you willing to ask God to forgive your sins, to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, as your Lord in your life, to pray that basic prayer, I, I gotta ask, I admit to you that I'm a sinner, that I'm separated from you. I ask you to forgive me through Jesus Christ. I want you to be the Savior and Lord of my life. Pray that prayer. That's meeting God where you're at. That's the starting point. There's some who have done that in the past. And many of us where we've done that, and what we realize is that over time, it's like, yeah, he's the center and, and over time, the world continues to draw us with its promises, with its blessings. And so that whereas God's been at the center, in theory, in practice, I start to make other things more important. And there are areas that I know he's calling me to and I don't really want to do it. And, and I feel like, well, if I do it, it's, a, you, know, you know, God's going to, I don't believe God. I don't want to surrender because I don't want to give up what I need, what is joyful, what is and here's where I want to challenge you for those that may be believers who are there. Do you see this call? 
It's not a call that is saying out of duty and do this and feel guilty if you don't. If you, it's Jesus saying, believe me, this is a treasure. This is this treasure that you're walking over and you're missing. And you know, this is this pearl that is there and you think that, you think that the trinkets are of great value and you're missing what is of supreme value. And ultimately it's a question, do you believe God? Are you gonna hold on to that, I know better than me, or are you gonna say, God, I agree with you that I'm not surrendering because I don't trust you, I don't believe you. And God invites you to surrender to him, not to give up and to live a life of duty, but to, to surrender to him because when you give up the things that you're pursuing that are a value but not supreme value, only then do you discover the one thing that we're created for, the true treasure that will meet our deepest needs, fill our deepest longings, be the supreme source of joy, a joy that transcends circumstances. And for some, God may be calling you to that today. Today's a day where God says, no, I want you to, I want you to live in that joy. Are you willing to surrender? Are you willing to come? Are you willing to believe me? To really seek after him, I need to believe that he is God, that he exists, that he knows better than me, that he's good, that he rewards those who seek him, that this is the life of blessing. Do you believe that? And that is it for this week's message. If you have a question about the message, Community Church, or Jesus Christ, send us a text to 330-400-3242. You can learn more about our events and community groups online at ccpl.life connect. There, you can also send in a prayer request. We would love to pray for you. Have a blessed Lord's Day and we'll see you next week.